some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and today I'm doing a discussion over Overlords of Infamy and the Misery Loves Company expansion. Uh, so, I actually have quite a history for this game for a couple reasons. One, Overlords of Infamy was the very first game that I ever received as a demo on this channel back whenever Obscure Reference Games was first putting it on Kickstarter and back when I probably had less than 100 subscribers. This game uh, and David was the first one to ever actually send me a prototype copy, which looking back was like nine or ten years ago, which is just insane to think about. And the version that I uh, have here is actually their second printing whenever they were going out for the uh, Misery Loves Company expansion. So it's actually insane uh, that... I'm doing a re-review, kind of, because I believe I have a run-through and a uh, discussion over this game on the channel from way back when. Um, and I'm redoing the review, one, because my channel has changed and my, my style and everything has changed over time. And uh, two, one, I want to talk about the expansion. And three, this past Gen Con in 2024, I actually demoed this game uh, every day except for Sunday. Uh, I, David and I have remained in touch and are, are friends to this day. So take that with what you will on what I say about this game. But you might think that me demoing it over and over and over would cause me to hate it. But the opposite actually happens to be true. Because I thought the same thing. I thought that me demoing it was going to have me never want to touch this game again because I don't play any game over and over and over uh, as much as I had to play and showcase this uh, during Gen Con. Uh, and what was so fascinating that I found for this was that the more I taught it, the more I realized how deep the game uh, systems actually are, which is very intriguing to find out. Normally, I'm not the kind of guy to try and figure out strategies for each character or to try and break the game in some way or to figure out every nook and cranny because I like to be surprised as much as the next person and feel like the game is the first time every single time I play it but as I was demoing it it was just fascinating to find out that what turned what looks like a charming uh simple worker placement game uh actually has some layers to it oh uh, so Overlords of Infamy is kind of a overall wacky theme with deep mechanisms, similar to like Roll Camera, where it's comical in its tone, but the mechanisms are very strategic. And in this game, all you are is you are one of many overlords, which could range from Waffles, the uh, the Corgi, this is the mascot of the, of the game, and I was actually given a plushie for this, and I was I, I could have it here, but then uh, my dogs got a hold of it, which is ironic, and it's now destroyed. So I don't have my plushie anymore, which is fine. Or Pancakes the Cat, or Monsieur Bivero, ranging all the way to Steve, the insufferable roommate, to uh, Lord Aether. Like, they range from wacky to, to serious, and backstories go from uh, very meta to also kind of dark, like Lord Aether's backstory, because every character has one on why they became an overlord. Like Monsieur Beaveros is that he was tricked into taking on student loans, so that's why he became an overlord. Waffles is that he ate uh, one of the relics, the bone that gave him, uh, yeah, the femur of acute brilliance, and then he realized that the hero kept going on adventures and leaving him behind. So... They range from that to Lord Aether doing like an AoE blast of magic that killed everyone. <laughs> and he kind of isolates himself into uh, a crystal palace that caused him to go insane. It's like, huh, hmm, okay, well, all of the, uh, like, his doesn't really line up with some of the others. So that's what it, oh, like, and then the plots are so witty. Like, this game has a, an insane amount of wit to it. Uh, with the way that the world events are worded, the flavor text on every single plot, like ranging from knavery to villainy to dominations. Like clearly knavery plots are as 
as ste- they're, they're, they're like almost mega mind level. Like steal candy from babies or blanket the region with glitter. Abolish breakfast or design a zombie board game that zombifies players. Uh, play an awful pop song on repeat 24-7. You're just like, hey, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm causing misery. misery. That's annoying. And then when you level up and go into dominations, you go capsize oil freighters with, with your tsunami amplifier. Merge natural, natural disasters with marine predators. Deny the existence of a raging global pandemic. So you can clearly see that they stop being silly and go into a lot more serious uh, as you kind of increase your infamy level. And that's what I uh, love about this game is that the beginning of the game starts off relatively slow. Like you are sending out workers, you know, gathering some resources, filling, you know, small, t- you're the small fry, your small time plots and then you get into the nuances. Like, I feel like the beginning of the game, which kind of is to its detriment, is a build-up for a lot of it. Uh, Like, once the game doesn't really kick off until kind of everyone is into villainies and dominations. So, I mean, however, it takes, like, no time at all to get into that, but the game also starts ramping up. Because if this game was just a work replacement resource management game, that would be no fun. But where the game gets incredibly strategic and tactile is whenever you start getting into your infamy, uh, your uh, your uh, espionage, not infamy. Well, it's related to your infamy, your espionage actions. This is where the game turns from being like, oh, <laughs> stole candy from babies. To, okay, now I'm going to assassinate all of your lackeys. I'm going to steal your relic, and you're not going to get to play anymore. Like, it becomes very, very cutthroat. And I feel like that can take a lot of players by surprise. You think, oh, I'm just going to send out a lackey. All right, I'm going to get some resources. To, okay, I'm at level 4 infamy. I can do the sabotage uh, uh, espionage action on you. And so I'm going to put a sabotage token on your plot. And it's a domination plot. That requires a lot of resources. You can't get rid of that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, place that on there. And whenever you complete it, you roll a die. Oh, you rolled a one. Guess it failed. And yeah, sorry, all those resources are gone. Or uh, using the level one, which I always thought was kind of a useless espionage action. It's just like, oh, I get to see what your plot is. However... What I that was the one that shocked me the most as I was demoing was how useful that is, because in a game about having the most points and sabotaging other players, you being able to look at someone's villainy or domination plot, knowing that half the deck of villainies have relics and dominations all have relics, knowing what relic your opponent needs to go out and just steal that or from the kingdom of good and hold on to that and or potentially uh, filter through the through the decks until you need it can be extremely powerful because while you're not stuck with a plot you can actually start from scratch which lowers your infamy level so you can get a new plot so if i go out and realize oh you need the planet's relic that is gonna um like have me go out and steal it so then if you're like oh okay well i could try and do uh an act of espionage to steal it back which is not impossible you just do that action and you know if you roll a four you can steal a relic um or because there's only one four on the die you can just lower your infamy but if you're lowering your infamy takes you from three to two where now you can only take a knavery plot that's, that's the decision you made. Um, and what's also fascinating about this game is I, re- I remember a lot of people kind of thinking that the game was going to take way too long. Well, one, you only have an hour to play, and really you have 45, 50 minutes. Um, but as the game goes on, because every time you complete a plot or harvest a resource, the world tension tracker goes up. And depending on the number of players, that's how many world events need to be completed. And in a four-player game, 10 world events need to be completed before the game ends. And it might seem like that's going to take forever, but as everyone is in villainy and dominations, 
then every villainy you complete moves it up by two. Every domination moves it up by three. Um, every time you steal a relic, which, like I said, half the villainy cards and all the domination cards need a relic. So it, when you're constantly trying to complete those, then it's just going to start ramping up. Uh, er, and again, harvesting resources, which you need more and more of with villainies and domination. So the game starts to speed up really quick. And before you know it, you're just like, oh, wow, we've, we've done nine world events and it's on five. Like, the game's about to end. And that's the kind of nuance that this game kind of hides. Like, it's all in the rule book, uh, but you don't really see it in action until you play this game quite a few times. And then you start looking and being like, oh, that's how this can be used. That's how this can be used. Like, a really good example is there is an NPC character uh, called the Adventuring Hero that the overlords use against one another. And I really like this system because if someone wants to turtle up and not touch the kingdom of good, well, one, they're not gonna be able to steal relics, or uh, not touch the contested zones, then the adventuring hero is still a way for the other overlords to mess with them. Like, cause the adventuring hero will kill lackeys. It'll, it'll liberate tiles, meaning it discards tiles from that player. So no one is actually truly safe if it's like, okay, well, we don't, we can't mess with you through espionage, then we're just going to send the adventuring hero your way. Um, but it's a double-edged sword because if, if we're not able to do espionage against you, you're not able to do espionage against us. But there's also extra levels of strategy because if you need a relic, you could, I mean, it would take some, some time and potentially a little bit of luck, you could touch the kingdom of good and then use an action to steal a relic if it's the one you need. And then if you get lucky enough, send the adventuring hero to the, the tile that's touching the, the kingdom. So you break your connection and it's like, oh, okay, no more sabotage, no more, no more espionage against me. But you're still able to get your relic. Uh, now it might take some time for you to do that, but that's still an, a level of strategy. Um, Every hero, hero, every overlord has a player power. And again, the more, there was uh, like one character that it was never ever picked in the, in the games that I was running. The Marauding Dark Knight, I don't think it was ever picked. Spiarkle was picked uh, quite a bit. The ones obviously that most people picked is waffles and, and pancakes. But Every single character has a, has a special power that is broken, but because they're all broken, none of them are broken. And there are such different levels of strategy for that. Like I just mentioned, you don't really want the adventuring hero to come towards you. Well, Spiarkle actually might, because uh, if Sparkle's lackey, which are the meeples, are killed by the, the adventuring hero, they actually gain two of the resources that that lackey was on. So if you just need to get, hoard a bunch of the same resource, well, then you could actually place a lackey out and harvest a resource to try and time it to where you're the one moving the adventuring hero, and then you could send him your way because you're the one controlling him, kill your lackey, get more of that resource. Or if you really want to turtle up, Monsieur Beavero lets you discard a uh, wood to search the map tiles to stacks for a wall tile and place it for free. And there are, I believe, 12 wall tiles in the stack, which are enough to completely wall off your zone of influence. So you could completely never be touched by the adventuring hero, uh, but you are gonna be able to be touched by the espionage actions. Which is also something cool about this game in that the actions in a game that's a worker placement and resource management, there is some thought of theme behind it. Like, uh, whenever you do the, the infiltrate espionage action, which is level two, that allows you to send a lackey from your barracks over to another player's zone of influence, but it doesn't increase the world tension like harvesting resources normally does. And it's like, well, why is that? And it's thematically, it's because it's an espionage action. You're going in and acting as that overlord's lackey, which doesn't cause any alarm. And it's like, okay, then it's up to that overlord to just, to sweep for infiltrators and be like, okay, now I'm, oh hey, you don't work for me. <laughs> I don't remember enslaving you, and then it's like, and then you you kill them off. Um, 
there's just a lot of intricacies to this game that really actually shocked me. Because I remember playing this, I remember liking it. Like, I never had any issues with that. I've always enjoyed Overlords of Infamy. Uh, because I thought it was, again, clever with its plot, clever with its flavor text. The world events, which I'll get to in a sec, are also still clever, again, with the flavor text and some of the, of the titles. But I have a newfound appreciation for it because I had played it so much, or I had demoed it so much, meaning I had to teach it to many different types of players. Um... And as far as I'm aware, there wasn't a single player that walked away, at least, well, actually, there was one. Um, which, I, it just, they had something else going on. Relatively, no one walked away from this being like, that game fucking sucked. Um, the one player just found one of the plots to be, like, they just, they if if they thought that plot was... Uh, not funny they just have a very difficult time separating you know uh, fact from fiction or fiction from fact whatever it was one of the neighbory plots is open up a vegan uh restaurant and secretly serve meat i like not even thinking because i handed everyone two neighbories which is how you start the game and she was like that's not funny that should be taken out of the game it's like oh and i was like oh shit like because there's some political jokes in here and i mean to each their own, which is fine, but it's like, oh, that one upsets you? Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, you've never laughed before in your life, have you? But there's, like, one of the, one of the plots is, um, oh, God, it's, uh, oh, build a wall and make the kingdom of good pay for it. There's some, uh, uh, some world events that are very um, pop culture reference-y. Like, like I said, the world events, some of them are, are kind of dated, like this one, which I probably would never do, and it's called uh, The Game. Uh, when this world event is revealed, say the following, I just lost the game. After your friends are finished yelling at you, continue playing as if nothing happened. Literally a world event, but, uh, I mean, that that's, that's, a, that's a dated reference, but you could completely like stack your world events you don't have to just shuffle them and the world events are your main source of i think like or dislike honestly because the world events are so polarizing they're really good for everyone or really bad for everyone or wacky in that there's one in there that makes everyone stand up and swap seats um there's one in here that makes everyone discard all resources, their entire plot, and basically reset the game. So there's there's some in here that are just kind of outlandish that it depends on your player group. And there's a ton in here. I don't know how many world events, but you can either curate it and be like, okay, here are 10 world events that we find funny. Or instead of meticulously doing that, you could just draw it and be like, Okay, here's our world event. The game, no. And you can discard it and just draw another one. Or if it's the one that makes everyone stand up and, and your group likes that kind of stuff. There's one in here about uh, doing a staring contest. Um, but there's also ones that could only affect you. Like it could only benefit you or it could only hurt you. And you, you just have to kind of accept that randomness in the game. Like... The other element of randomness is searching for map tiles when you need specific resources, but I think that's mitigated by going out towards the contested zones, which are the printed resource on the board. And I actually really like that. I like that the map tiles are random because you could get lucky and get the resources you need, but it's incentivizing you to go out and uh, exploit the land towards those contested zones because that means that if your uh, neighbor is gonna do the same, then you're gonna start doing acts of espionage against one another, which is where a huge part of the game is. That's where I feel like the game is unique from others and stands out and is kind of where uh, a lot of the game feels like it really uh, exists, if that makes sense. Like, everything else is bog standard. Worker placement, 
you you know resource management to fulfill a card, but the espionage actions are such a, uh, like a part of the theme and how you're going to actually compete and get ahead of your opponents. So, really, the world events I kind of accept. Um, like I I don't really like I love some of them. I hate others, uh, and then. What's also really cool is the domination and villainies all have special ab uh, abilities. Knaveries don't. Like knaveries, I there's a ton in there. I think that's almost a little misleading uh, because that's where most people are going to start, or not most. That's where everyone's going to start, and you think that the game is just kind of a silly, fun party game almost, but then it quickly turns into not that. So if you're not expecting a cutthroat game, and then you start realizing it is, then that can be. Uh, a huge down, like a huge, um, I don't know, whatever, whatever the word is, like a huge turn off. There we go. Because if your if your group doesn't like cutthroat games, then this game might not actually be for you because it's it can be very very cutthroat. Uh, I mean, I guess you could turn it into not that. You could be like, oh, let's talk about what relics we need. But then why play a competitive game? and a game that is matching everything to the theme. Uh, but I also love the fact that the villainies and dominations have aftermath abilities, which are special abilities that could be, you know, passive ones for you, or one-time use, which could just be huge. Like, one villainy I've had is that the special ability is if anyone's going to do an active espionage against me, I can just cancel that. Be like, nope, you're not going to do that to me. And... Completing those can be very, very helpful. Um, other things that I don't really, don't really like. I mean, from a production standpoint, I don't like the world events. Uh, you have a world event like this, and then the cards are upside down. If you if you flip them like over, like left it like horizontal. Um, I'm guessing they. Uh, they wanted you to flip it vertical, which works. Uh, that's just, I'm always like flipping. I'm like, okay, what's the event? Ugh. So, but it's, that's a, that's a really a nitpick. The expansion and everything fits in the game in the second version. My copy, cause I, this is the second time I've had this expansion cause I backed this thinking that there wasn't a second printing. So I was like, okay cool and then this was like not really compatible with my version at all um there's just a level of charm to it because you don't really see games like this anymore the art style is unique uh it feels fully produced but still kind of homey at the same time other than that like i really don't have many many complaints What's also neat is you can actually play this as a five-player game, and the fifth player plays as the adventuring hero. And that could be really cool because uh, in the expansion, yeah, the expansion adds personas for the adventuring hero, so normally they would just control it. And it's like, oh, you know, the world tension hit three, six, or nine. Now, you know, turns interrupted, adventuring hero, the person playing him rolls a die and moves. And then once everyone is gone, the adventuring hero always goes last. And now they have actions that they can do. And they're trying to complete hero quests. And these hero quests can be brutal. Like, because they're trying to complete a certain number of quests equal to the world events. Uh, two, for every two world event needed to complete the game, they have to complete one hero quest. Meaning, in a four-player game, ten world events end the game. Hero needs to complete five quests, and they win. So it turns into kind of a one versus many wall tiles spike tiles and certain special abilities become a lot more beneficial but it's it's fascinating because these world events can be so uh damaging to the players like one that i have actually seen a player complete was the steal a relic action now costs three actions when it normally costs two so it takes pretty much your whole turn to steal a relic and the more hero quests they do, the more damaging it is to the overlords, which again can be a uh, a really interesting game. So it does support up to five. Everyone I talked to that played as the adventuring hero said they liked it. Some actually preferred it over the others, which was kind of interesting. 
Um, and the game also does play solo, and I gotta be honest, I really don't like the solo, like, at all. And not that it doesn't work, I feel like that you miss out on the acts of espionage. Like, these are so, to me, crucial to the game that not being able to do these feels like you're missing half the game. It's like, oh, I guess I'll collect resources by myself and complete plots that affect no one. Like, it just feels like I I would never play this solo. I, I don't have, I just, it's like, all right, yeah, it can. Like, you can play it solo. It's, it's functional. You're just missing out on a lot. Aftermaths that affect other players, world events that would affect other players, uh, espionage that affects other players. It's just you're missing out on many key components when playing it solo. Um, so that's all for the base game of Overlords of Infamy. The expansion uh, is a really cool expansion too. Like one, it just adds more characters. Uh, pancakes, which is again, like just something small and clever. Waffles or pancakes, dog versus cat. Um, and her ability is really good too. It adds Steve, like all these characters on the front. Yes, yeah, Spiarkle, uh, Monsieur Bivero, Steve the insufferable roommate, and then the girl that no one picked. Um, the Marauding Dark Knight. It adds more characters, more world events, more plots. All of that is is just added, which is just good. And then it also adds Huff the Tragic Dragon, which is also interesting because this adds a new tile of Huff has destroyed the Kingdom of Good, and now the adventuring hero is kind of allying with the overlords. Like, he's still trying to complete journeys, which, uh, if I remember right, the journeys he has to try and complete is... Uh, I think, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, find a noble steed, get a magical sword, and slay the dragon. Uh, but he's also weirdly allying with the overlords, but the uh, dragon is now kind of the big bad NPC that is moving around, trying to complete indomitable, I think it was indomitable, dragon imperatives, or what they're trying to, what they're trying to complete. So it does add a new level of spice to the game if you've played this quite a bit, and also gives a fifth player playing as the adventuring hero kind of more purpose, which is really cool. Like I think adding more to the adventuring hero as a fifth player is a very neat idea. And it all works if the adventuring hero is an NPC too. So if it's not like, oh, we have to have five DC expansion. No, it all, it's all functional if the uh, if the adventuring hero is an NPC or if he's actually being played. Um, then, I mean, just extra stuff, there are secret schemes, which are just kind of private objectives. Uh, have most of your completed plots require uh, a specific resource could get you 10 points. There are, and the game with the most fauna tiles in your zone of influence gets you seven points. So secret private objectives. Um, and there's also kind of new actions that players can take of pu putting out piles of meat or putting out ballistas that will be used kind of as traps for like the meat is whenever the dragon moves, it's going to run towards the meat instead. It has to go towards that or the ballistas. If it moves by and it's carrying something, it takes damage and drops what it's carrying. So it gives all the players a little bit more to do and just adds again, more theme to the game. So it's a small expansion, but I like it. I like that there's basically a new mode, and then the rest of the stuff is just more to the game. Like, it doesn't have... You can just buy all this for the extra stuff. And what's also cool is, like, the new cards will reference the Huff the Tragic Dragon or whoever, but it's like, if not playing with that, then do this. Like, it's not like, oh, this card's obsolete because we're not playing with that. No, it just now has a different function, which is cool. Some characters who have plots or abilities specifically for the dragon just do something different now. It's not like they don't have an ability or you can't use them. So the expansion is also a really good add-on. I This game just has a soft spot in my heart, honestly. Like, 
I pride myself on being very unbiased with my reviews. Um, if anyone has watched any of my reviews or seen most people who do actually talk about my channel know that, I mean, I'm not getting paid by David or Obscure Reference Games to do this review. It's, even though I've known, uh, known them for years at this point and was given the opportunity to do a review for a prototype as the very first one when my channel started. Um, if this game sucked, I would tell you guys it sucked, but I really just think that there's something special here. It's a unique worker placement game that I've still never seen. Like, I've never seen this theme done. Uh, I'm sure it's out there, but it's never hitting the same spot like this one has. I've never seen worker placement games where you're trying to complete plots that give you special abilities for that. And I've never seen something like the espionage actions that increase with your power that adds more levels of, of um, strategy as the game goes on. Uh, and then the game, and the game's also not insanely long, even though your first couple rounds, it's gonna feel like it's gonna take forever. And then the game ends and you're like, oh shit. Like maybe there's a meta, but like, cause I've always thought, oh, first person to complete the domination is gonna win. Well, then I've seen people do different strategies. I've seen people only take knavery plots until they get to five and then they start taking dominations. Like just ramp up to five. There's world events in here. I'd have to search for it, but it's called Winter Has Come. That literally says, increase all overlords infamy level by one. Like, or you killed my father, prepare to die. And the adventure hero is going to move four spaces and kill all lackeys in those four spaces and take all resources from tiles he stands on. There's world events like the Snap, the Adventuring Hero, Huff the Tragic Dragon, and each Overlord discard half uh, of their resources. I wonder what, what that reference is to. Uh, Dance Macabre, any lackeys killed before the next world event card is revealed uh, are returned to their Overlord's barracks at the end of the turn. And every single card has flavor text. There's just such a charm um, to this game that I still find. I mean, yeah, some of it's dated and but it's dated to me. There could be people who are playing this game who draw the game card and are like, oh, you asshole. Like, it's like, oh, man, it's been 30 years since I ever thought of that and I was, I was on the streak. Um, but it, it hits different groups differently. Like, some people, like, I had such wildly different groups of people taking it, like, really seriously and still had a great time. And I've seen people who were cracking up at every single card. Um, or some people, like my last group that I demoed for, what had me rolling because all of their plots and world events were just a, kind of weird uh, to fuck on the adventuring hero. They're like, this guy's a nerd. <laughs> like, we're just bullying him. One someone's plot was uh, fill up the adventuring hero's gauntlets with mayonnaise. And it's like, oh man, now I feel bad. And before the demo ended, we got the you killed my father, prepare to die. And he like ran in and just annihilated all, all of someone's lackeys except for one. And it's like, yeah, well, I mean, you kept you kept making fun of him, and now he got he, he went out and killed all your all your people. Now you're kind of screwed. So and they just had a blast. I think they ended up buying the game too. But it's it's it hits a spot for every group, which is something that I can't say for a lot of these types of games. Um. Yeah, so on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, I'm going to give Overlords of Infamy uh, and the expansion a 9. I think this game is great. Uh, if I, it would be lower if I had, you know, demoed this and by the end of it I was like, if I even see this game I'm going to throw up. But that's not the case. Like, I'm as charmed with it as ever and I'm even more charmed with it as I'm doing my review over it because it's just... I don't know. It's 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 something that's that's unique here, and I think that it it could fit in a lot of uh, people's uh, collection, and is gonna kind of be unheard of. Like, I don't hear anyone talking about this game unless they're going to a convention. So, that's my thoughts on Overlords of Infamy. 
I mean, come on, there's a corgi. Like, what else? I should have just said that. This should have been a two second review, and I should have just been like, look, there's a corgi as a playable character. There you go. Oh, you hate dogs? Well, get the expansion. Now there's a cat. Who cares about everyone else? Oh, you hate dogs and cats? There's a beaver. Like, you're done. You're done. What, what more reason do you need? But that's my thoughts on Overlords of Infamy and the expansion of Misery Loves Company. Let me know what you think of the game in the comments below. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.